welcome to the launch of the European Innovation Council. I'm Mark Ferguson, and I'm the chair of the advisory board of the European Innovation Council. And we have a star-studded lineup for you this morning to celebrate this really important event in Europe. But I'm going to commence with a quotation from Rudyard Kipling, which I think sums up today's auspicious occasion. And the quotation is as follows. This is the opening verse of the opening chapter of the book of endless possibilities. And I think that sums up where we are today with the European Innovation Council. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, who will speak to us, and she will be followed by Emmanuel Macron, the president of France. Commission president, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and good morning, what a bit day. I am delighted indeed to welcome all of you to the launch of the European Innovation Council. And we all know this launch could not come at a better time. As we will emerge from the pandemic, innovation will be key for the success of our digital and our green agenda. And we all know Europe is a powerhouse in science. Our new Horizon Research Program is the largest ever, but we also face a big paradox. We Europeans are excellent in making science with money, but we're not so good in making money out of science. And the new European Innovation Council is there to help resolve this paradox. With it put in place, we want to have an ecosystem that gives entrepreneurs every opportunity to create a world leading company. With our Innovation Council, we make 10 billion euros available until 2027. We fund small and medium sized companies with high risk, but also with high potential. We support innovative researchers that have ideas for the next breakthrough technology. And we offer coaching, matchmaking, and support them to set up a business. The European Innovation Council is also part of our answer to the equity funding gap in Europe. Currently, many European startups cannot find the risk capital they need. Experts estimate this, that this funding gap is as large as 70 billion euros. Our new EIC fund is a good start. It alone brings 3 billion euros to the table. And with the EIC fund, the Commission is, for the first time, investing directly in startups and SMEs. And this will also help attract additional risk capital from the private sector. Because if we want innovative ideas to make it to the market, we have to support those Europeans who are willing to take risks. There is no time to waste. And this is why today we don't just cut ribbons. We get down to business and launch the first calls. Over 1.5 billion euros are foreseen alone for this year. Most of this will directly support SMEs and startups. Half of the finance at least will support the Green Deal, digital technologies and health innovation. And with this, the EIC fits well into our overall strategy for the coming years. We want to come out of this crisis stronger than before. We want Europe to build forward better, more sustainable, more digital and more resilient. We already know that the EIC is well equipped to help us achieve these goals because its work didn't start today. Since 2018, in a pilot phase, it has already supported over 5,000 startups, SMEs and research projects. 159 companies were already selected to receive venture capital from the Commission. The very first company, by the way, was a medical SME, Core Wave from France. Core Wave develops innovative heart pumps 
They work with membranes and reduce complications for patients with heart failure. In January, the company received 15 million euros from the European Union and attracted 20 million euros from private investors. And with this, CoreWave could build up manufacturing, complete tests and start clinical trials so that soon patients can benefit from this innovation. And this is what Europe can achieve when finance meets science, when ideas turn into innovation and products on the market. Ladies and gentlemen, 14 years ago, we created the European Research Council to support top researchers based on scientific excellence. The European Innovation Council we are crea creating today will be its strong partner to support breakthrough technology and scale up disruptive innovation. With the launch of the EIC, we kind of complete the research and innovation landscape in Europe. And we also demonstrate the innovative potential of Europe and the European institutions. And with this, I declare Europe open to innovation and I look forward to many successes. Thank you very much for your attention. Face au grand défi d'aujourd'hui et de demain, des pandémies qui menacent de se multiplier, une population qui vieillit, un environnement qu'il faut protéger, un virage numérique à maîtriser, des défis technologiques connus et encore inconnus, une conflictualité géopolitique sans cesse croissante, l'Europe doit prendre le tournant de l'innovation de rupture. Elle n'a pas d'autre choix que d'être en pointe. Et manquer ce tournant, c'est risquer de se retrouver tributaire des grandes puissances extérieures. L'Europe de demain sera technologique, sans quoi elle risque simplement de ne pas être ou d'être trop peu. C'était tout le sens de mon discours à la Sorbonne en septembre 2017, lorsque j'ai appelé de mes voeux la création d'une agence européenne de l'innovation de rupture. Les premières pierres en sont désormais posées avec le lancement du Conseil européen de l'innovation qui marque la jonction entre les priorités nationales et les priorités européennes. Je veux ici tirer mon chapeau à la Commission européenne qui a fait preuve d'une efficacité remarquable en posant les fondations du Conseil européen de l'innovation en un temps record. Avec cet outil ambitieux, doté de 10 milliards d'euros, l'Europe se donne les moyens de poser les vrais choix technologiques. N'ayons pas peur de parler de planification technologique et sur ce socle solide, d'engager des moyens financiers et humains. Avoir une vision, faire des choix, prendre des risques, ce sont des conditions sine qua non pour l'émergence et la réussite de futurs champions européens. L'excellence de notre recherche dans les domaines nouveaux doit en effet pouvoir créer de la valeur sur le sol européen qui doit devenir un terreau fertile en savoir, en application, dans une logique de continuum entre nos laboratoires, nos start-up, nos industries, entre la recherche fondamentale et la recherche finalisée et technologique jusqu'au développement industriel, entre l'idée et l'impact. Le Conseil européen de l'innovation amorce cette logique de décloisonnement. Faire tomber les barrières sectorielles, faire circuler les projets, fluidifier le passage de la recherche fondamentale aux retombées sociales. Soutenir les femmes, et elles sont nombreuses à l'EIC, et les hommes qui portent ces projets. Le rôle majeur de l'innovation de rupture dans la réponse européenne à la crise sanitaire le prouve. Nous devons développer des idées radicalement nouvelles qui puissent préparer l'économie et les emplois de demain et même d'après-demain. Cette logique qui prend forme, qui prend force, doit être déployée de manière accélérée en se libérant des carcans administratifs, en se concentrant sur son cœur de cible qui est la création de valeur et l'impact. Nous devons penser et agir différemment. C'est tout le rôle des directeurs de programmes qui devront disposer de l'autonomie nécessaire à des projets risqués. Donner un grand coup d'accélérateur à l'innovation passe indiscutablement par une augmentation de nos financements. Il ne s'agit en aucun cas de favoriser une innovation de rupture à deux vitesses, mais de donner toutes leurs chances 
aux entreprises européennes capables de devenir les licornes, voire les géants de demain. Pour cela, il faudra que l'Europe, notamment à travers l'EIC, puisse soutenir ces entreprises sur toute la chaîne de financement, y compris ce qu'on appelle le « late stage ». Par ailleurs, si les financements sont le nerf de la guerre, nos futurs champions doivent également bénéficier d'un accompagnement spécifique. Pensez au niveau européen, comme nous avons pu le faire en France, avec le Next Forti. Enfin, nous devons aussi lutter contre les freins réglementaires à la croissance de ces entreprises en concevant des politiques favorables à l'innovation. Une convergence des élans, des idées et des efforts est nécessaire à la solidité de notre stratégie européenne. Il nous faut rapprocher nos initiatives nationales pour affiner la pertinence des programmes, générer un effet de levier financier, renforcer leur efficacité. Et le faire avec un dialogue étroit entre États membres et commissions pour choisir ensemble les défis auxquels le Conseil de l'innovation devra s'atteler. C'est ce type de démarche qui donne tout son sens au principe de subsidiarité cher à la construction européenne. C'est mon espoir et mon appel aujourd'hui. Mobilisons l'écosystème européen, l'écosystème de recherche, l'écosystème entrepreneurial, l'écosystème de financement, l'écosystème public et privé, pour favoriser l'émergence de champions technologiques capables de créer des emplois, d'œuvrer au progrès et d'assurer notre souveraineté. C'est tout l'objet de l'initiative Scale Up Europe que j'ai appelée de mes voeux. Faisons de l'EIC un outil de fierté et de réussite collective, un instrument de la puissance européenne. Investissons, prenons des risques, n'ayons pas peur d'éventuels échecs qui arriveront. Actons ensemble des paris, donnons toute leur chance à nos meilleurs talents. En somme, faisons de l'EIC un levier de notre avenir. Thank you, and thank you to the Commission President and to President Macron for those strong words of support. So as you've heard, today is the EIC official launch, and the European Innovation Council has been in pilot phase until now. And it's been my privilege to chair the advisory board of the European Innovation Council, and I want to give you some of the vision from that board. The European Innovation Council represents the most ambitious initiative that Europe has ever undertaken in the field of innovation. It's a unique European approach to innovation. It focuses on relevant innovations conducted in responsible ways. It combines a DARPA-like approach to advanced research with an accelerator for scale-up. And the European Innovation Council will become a hallmark of innovation excellence in the same way that the European Research Council has become a global hallmark of research excellence. The European Innovation Council will overcome biases. We will overcome biases against female entrepreneurs. We will overcome biases against entrepreneurs from less known regions of the European Union. We will crowd in private investment. Private investment in European deep tech, the 10 billion budget of the European Innovation Council aims to crowd in at least 50 billion from the private sector. Those investments are critical to allow the deep tech innovative companies to grow and scale in Europe. And the European Innovation Council was, will act as an impact fund, a fund to translate the research findings from researchers in the European Research Council or in the missions or any of the other European programs and from the national member state programs translate those deep tech research innovations into businesses that can scale and grow in Europe. The European Innovation Council will become the investor of choice for visionary researchers and visionary entrepreneurs who want to grow and scale their businesses in Europe. We will be innovation friendly, one innovation community with three principal instruments Pathfinder, Transition, and Accelerator. And tomorrow, there is a day dedicated to potential applicants to the European Innovation Council, where you will learn more about our programs and be able to ask interactive questions through Slido so that you can apply to grow and scale your business in Europe. 
The European Innovation Council will be agile, dynamic, a really flexible approach to European uh, Commission funding for innovation. We will work together with corporates. We will crowd in corporates, leveraging not only their financial uh, investments, but also their capabilities in supply chain sales to create a perfect European innovation uh, community. And as the Commission President said, we will address important problems of digitalization, the green agenda, climate change, sustainability. What could be better than founding a company that can create employment, that can grow the economy, that can make money, and that can do good for the planet at the same time? Nothing could be better. And that's the aim of the European Innovation Council. And I'm really pleased that this aim is embodied uh, within the commissioner, uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel, who is better placed than me to put forward the vision of the European Innovation Council. Uh, Maria Gabriel is the European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce her to say a few words about the European Innovation Council. Commissioner Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to say that, yes, today we are celebrating the birth of the fully fledged European Innovation Council with the first tranche of EIC calls for funding for deep tech startups in seed stage and series A worth over one and a half billion euros. And I would like to start by thanking all the people that have made possible that today the European Innovation Council is born. I'm thinking here in my predecessor, Carlos Moedas, the Parliament Rapporteur, Christian Eller, but also in the members of the board that represent innovation ecosystem as a whole, as well as the hundreds of experts and officials that have participated in the last three years in the ideation and piloting phases of this new European endeavor. And allow me here to start by summarizing in few words what the European Innovation Council is. It is a major new component of Horizon Europe with its own budget, over 10 billion euros, its own governance with an independent board of innovators, its own proactive approach to management with hands-on program managers, and with an innovative way to support innovators, equity investments by the EIC fund. It is designed to provide financial and ecosystem support to see stage and serious ace disruptive startups. And I would like now to focus on the three reasons that made us to set up the EIC on the first place. First, the so-called European innovation paradox, that Europe is a world leader in science and research, but that other regions lead on innovation. So the EIC will build on the amazing research base in Europe to support disruptive, deep tech and market creation startups. This will be a priority role for the EIC program managers that will work closely with the European Research Council and with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Second, the difficulties for European deep tech startups to get enough funding for growth. Deep tech is considered as the fourth wave of innovation and brings the power of combining software and hardware to develop the transformational, disruptive innovations that we need for a fair, green and digital pandemic recovery. We are talking about synthetic biology, advanced materials, photonics, quantum computing, artificial intelligence. They are problem oriented and not only technology driven. And they are purpose driven innovators. 97% of deep tech ventures contribute to at least one of the UN's sustainable development goals. The European Innovation Council Accelerator has already a good track record of supporting deep tech startups with successful examples, which are becoming global leaders in their domains. Beyond grants, the ESC will invest equity into these companies to finance their scale up and to attract other investors to finance these amazing companies. With around 550 million euros this year, the EIC fund will become a top deep tech early stage investor in Europe. 
The third obstacle is that the EIC will help innovators overcome the fragmentation of the ecosystem. More and more locations in Europe have established world leading ecosystems in the last years, from Sofia to Madrid, from Warsaw to Stockholm. Unfortunately, the ecosystem is not well connected at European level and many regions face the risk to be left behind. So I'm aware of this need to have everyone on board and on equal foot. And if we really want to make full use of the potential of our ecosystems, we need to address this, this challenge. Because the ecosystem is not only fragmented, it is also concentrated in some big cities and we are missing women talent. Today, when we talk about women talent, three quarters of startups in Europe are funded by men, while only 8% are funded by all women teams. And this lack of diversity translates into the low amount of capital invested into women-led and managed companies, creating a vicious circle. In 2019, 92% of all funds raised by the European venture capital-backed companies went to all male funding teams. So a major endeavor for the EIC is to upgrade the overall European innovation ecosystem. This will be achieved by fully involving the ecosystem in all of its activities and decisions, in the board, in all investment decisions, creating networks of corporate and public procurers, networks of investors in C stage and series A, and by working in partnership with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. The EIC, and that's my wish, will reach out to find and attract the untapped innovation potential in all our 27 member states, as well in urban, as well in rural areas, paying special attention to continue increasing the percentage of women-led startups in Europe. So I'm really proud that again, on these issues, we have already results. Since I'm in commissioner responsible for EIC, just allow me to give you an example. The percentage of women-led startups benefiting from EIC support has grown from eight to 34% while keeping excellence as the selection criteria. And now we would like to increase this to close to 50%. But besides the direct beneficiaries of the EIC, I think in the whole group of women innovators. That is why, in addition to the Women Tech Initiative that I announced earlier this month, I'm proud today to announce the launch of the 2021 edition of the European Prize for Women Innovators, dedicated to the memory of Dr. Shimrit Perkel Finkel who was awarded the prize in 2019 and has tragically passed away earlier this month. Shimrit was a brilliant marine biologist and a visionary entrepreneur. With this prize, we want to create role models for women and girls everywhere and inspire the next generation to follow in their footsteps. Also with the aim of building innovation ecosystems, I'm announcing today the launch of the Capital of Innovation, Innovation Awards that this year is also targeting mid-sized cities. We need to ensure that the new wave of innovation reaches out to all corners of Europe. Well, the European Innovation Council that we are launching today will definitely change the landscape of European innovation and will contribute to the main political priorities of the EU. First, we want that the EIC has an immediate impact on the pandemic recovery by changing the application process into an agile and shorter process. As of today, startups can apply at any time to the EIC accelerator with a simple video pitch, some slides and a short form. EIC experts will evaluate their idea immediately and provide feedback within a few weeks, asking for a full proposal in June. This means that we'll be able to sign the first grants in early autumn. The process for providing equity has also been streamlined 
and the investment committee will participate in the interviews as well to speed the equity part of the support. And our goal is that grant and equity are provided with a very small difference of time. Second, the EIC is also part of our European ambitions on the Green Deal and digitization. In the first EIC calls that are being announced today, there is at least 300 million euros earmarked for Green Deal technologies and startups, as well as at least 150 million euros for strategic digital technologies. And finally, through investing in deep tech startups, the EIC will also safeguard future European technological sovereignty. We have seen the problems that arise when Europe is depending on others for critical technologies. And the EIC will invest in emerging technologies and companies to make sure we have European technology champions and that we are not reliant or dependent on others. So, in conclusion, the launch of the European Innovation Council is definitely one of the priorities for all of us. And I'm really extremely proud of what has been achieved. But it is also the starting point for a broader reform of the European innovation policy. Over the coming months, we'll be working together with the innovation community, with all our stakeholders, to see how we can have a real pan-European innovation ecosystem for the benefit of this new breed of innovators. That will be an ambitious endeavor, but the creation of the EIC demonstrates that Europe can set a high ambition for innovation. So let me finish by calling on the whole innovation community across Europe and beyond. Put forward your best ideas as proposals to the European Innovation Council. Invest with us in a new generation of European innovative champions. Help us unlock the talent across all of Europe's regions and from women innovators. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and thank you, Commissioner, uh, very much indeed. So the European Innovation Council is being launched today around Europe, and over 100 leading innovators, researchers, and investors have come forward to be EIC champions. So let's hear from some of them. Are you ready? If you're an entrepreneur, if you're an innovator, if you have vision and ambition, and if you firmly believe that your innovation has the potential to make a positive impact and to compete on a global scale, then you must seize this opportunity. AIC, a new horizon program, offers unprecedented chance for the scientists to bring their technologies to the market and help society to deal with the biggest issues we have today. Check in the EIC, check the programs, see what means are there for you, what means are there to translate your ideas into something practice. Okay? We, as society, will be waiting for that. Together with uh, co-investors from the private market, we're just adding um, a lot of funding into an area uh, where companies um, with disruptive technologies from the deep tech, med tech, biotech sector, renewable energies. If you are a deep tech startup or an innovative research team looking to get your idea off the ground, I encourage you to apply for one of the many different opportunities. It also enhances the European innovation ecosystem through partnership with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, the European Research Council, and national regional agencies and ecosystem builders. And also we'll be very happy to syndicate with other investors, with other venture capitalists for promising financing rounds into deep tech startups in European companies. Thanks to the EIC, European innovators don't need to automatically go to Silicon Valley any longer. With over 10 billion euros to invest in breakthrough technologies 
and game-changing innovations, it contributes to the Green Deal and Economic Recovery Package in Europe. Each startup can compete, literally compete, for up to 17.5 million euros in non-dilutive grants and patient capital in order to scale so that we can truly start up Europe and scale up Europe. EAC shares funds but also mentorship of coaches that help to assess the business feasibility and market opportunity. EIC has a strong focus on diversity, gender and inclusion, which is built into its very DNA, from the strategic level down to hands-on KPIs. I particularly encourage women innovators to sign up. So dear researchers, entrepreneurs, SMEs, corporates, we should celebrate this is happening just now. So it's now my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Christian Ehler, who is a member of the European Parliament. Mr. Ehler was a very early supporter of the EIC when the idea was first launched. He played a really critical role in the legislation as the lead rapporteur in the European Parliament for the Horizon Europe specific programme. And that programme sets out how the EIC will be implemented. Mr. Ehler, we're very grateful for your contributions in the Parliament, and I would now like to give you the floor. Thank you, Mark, um, and thank you for the opportunity to look a little bit back because we are very lucky that we have two had two commissioners in a row actually having the merits to establish the EIC, but I would like to salute for a moment um, Carlos Moedas, if I may. When in early 2015 over lunch he told me about this project, I was hesitating for a moment, pretty much saying we have to be brave. And when he said, it's not a top-down project. I want to reach out to the stakeholders. It should be developed with a new crowd of entrepreneurs, younger people, sometimes dropouts of universities, entrepreneurs, literally not having anything to do with the traditional setting of research funding. I said, wow, what, what a journey to go. This was not a plan uh, top-down. This was a commissioner open to talk to a new generation, a new breed of innovators. And if you read um, literally um, the, the cooking receipt for the EIC, you can sense there had been questions, even resistance. I mean, I will remember when the first time journalists reflecting that they had been desperately playing with the acronyms of the European Research Programme saying, research boss wants to work the ERC magic on innovation. And then followed by an article raising all skepticism you could imagine. And even in an administration, if you, you be honest, if you're a commissioner and you tell them about a plan to have an EIC with a continuous evaluation of the performance and agil agility and speed require um, acting portfolio management, including reallocation of resources, strengthening or weakening of individual budgets, or even terminating projects, new executive agency and program managers, which need um, the independence to make clear choices, change direction, shift resources, fast track to research and innovation projects, bottom up calls, shorter time to grant, support provided only by small collaborative consortia composed of, of just a few, different and independent eligible legal entities. I mean, let's be realistic, what a nightmare for the traditional research administrations. And so I would like to salute the bravery of the Commission. I like to salute the bravery of Carlos Moedas individually. And I want to express um, the gratitude of the Parliament, but also the backing of the Parliament for this EIC. We want you to be brave. Um, we wouldn't say we want you to lose money, but we encourage you not to fear budget control procedures, legal procedures. We want to be flexible. We want that you take risk and we are willing to follow that path that it has an experimental component still. Um, you want, we want you to come us and say, we have to change the project to some extent. And um, we want to see your success, but you will give you any kind of backing for this new flexible instrument. And I think um, the, the parliament will be the place and had been the place also in terms of the budget, because let's be realistic, that had been seen as a cannibalization of traditional research money. 
which is not true. And let's be honest, if that is a success project, we have to talk about money because the 10 billion sounds much, but in perspective, we need even more money. This is a thirsty new crowd, but it will be a, su a successful new crowd. So thank you very much for all your efforts. I would really like to thank Maria Gabriel to putting that through a difficult budget procedure. I like to thank the research ministers because in the end they became brave. I like to thank President Macron because without the help on the presidential level, that would never have happened. And I would like to remind that this also shows that the EC, the European Commission, the European project is still flexible, is reaching out to new crowds and it's fast enough to deliver because we delivered it in one term. So it's a wonderful day and I would like to thank my old friend Carlos Moedas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Ehler, for those uh, kind words and, and for the strong support. And, and indeed, I echo uh, the uh, thanks to uh, both Commissioner Gabriel and to Commissioner Modash uh, for their support. It's now my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Manuel Hator, the Minister for Science, Technology and Higher Education in the Government of Portugal, to present the views uh, from the Council. Mr. Hator has been Minister since 2015. He's contributed to the political debate on the EIC and the negotiations on Horizon Europe, and he currently chairs the Competitiveness Council for the Portuguese Presidency of the European Commission, which has been launching uh, Horizon Europe. So I now give the floor uh, to Minister Manuel Heitor. Good morning to everyone. We should be very proud to launch today the European Innovation Council. Most of us do remember the discussion over the last two to three years about the issue of innovation and how could we gain from the unique experience throughout Europe of the European Research Council in a similar uh, initiative towards innovation. And let me acknowledge all of those that have contributed for this major um, initiative within Horizon Europe. Actually, uh, Horizon Europe has just been approved. We launched it on, on the 2nd of um, February. Uh, and I'm sure that it will provide a number of breakthrough initiatives throughout um, Europe. Overall, science creates markets. Science yields, we know very well from the, the pandemic crisis we live on, but also the development of um, economic activities of higher added value do create and do have new scientific problems. And this continuous interaction between science and the markets, the markets and science, are today particularly critical to be engaged through new stakeholders where startups and small um, firms, small, small in business, um, are particularly critical in an European landscape, together with research organizations and large firms and government and non-government organizations. So the, the role of SMEs and in particular science-based um, uh, startups has been particularly relevant throughout the world and also in Europe. And the relevance of the European Innovation Council is particularly, is particularly concerned with a market failure very well identified in Europe to facilitate the growth of these startups. Actually, we have identified in many European countries and the Commission over the years, the gap particularly in the funding schemes uh, not only in the seeding phase, but above all in the growth process of startups. And the European Innovation Council has this mission to stimulate, to facilitate, and to complement other, other funding schemes, particularly now oriented towards a new stimulus to the growth of small and medium enterprises with a science base. And these are breakthroughs throughout the entire landscape. For example, um, in the electrification area, 
we know today that advance, advancements in science, but also needs in the markets towards the electrification of mobility will require a new generation of solid state cells, particularly lithium cells, which will depend, among many other issues, on the atomic deposition of nanoparticles. This is an area is an, where emerging SMEs are being launched. We have also had, during the pandemic, the, 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 the creation of vaccines, particularly based on new technologies like the DNA and BioNTech, together with Pfizer, is a clear example of the growth of a small European startup, which, with a science base, is evolving towards um, the benefit of population at large. Examples are um, various and very diversified throughout every single European region. And again, the European Innovation Council was created within Horizon Europe with an earthquake budget to facilitate the growth of companies throughout Europe. And throughout Europe is, in, is important because we have understood that European science policy must be inclusive together with an innovation strategy, which will facilitate and must facilitate more and more the enlargement of Europe, in particular, the engagement of every single European region in our common goal of creating always a better future with more knowledge. And these do require about our innovation capacity. So we should be proud by launching the European Innovation Council and to facilitate a new stimulus to the growth of small um, um, companies and in particular science-based startups throughout Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister Haytor. Now I mentioned earlier, it was my privilege to chair the board of the European Innovation uh, Council, the advisory board. And that's a group of wonderful people, of, of innovators, of corporates, of investors and so on. And in line with our innovative, impish way of working, we're now going to have a speed dating session. In this speed dating session, you'll see exchanges around three of the key objectives for the EIC. To build great businesses from breakthrough science, to change the landscape on deep tech investment in Europe, and to build ecosystems for the transition to a green and digital economy. And those uh, reflect uh, the ambitions of the board of, of the European Innovation Council. And we've issued today a statement, uh, which you can see on the EIC website. Each of these speed dating sessions will match a member of the European Innovation Council Advisory Board with other innovators, investors, and researchers, and I'll have a distinguished moderator. And after the final uh, session, the moderator of that session, Jean-Eric Piquet, the Director General for Research and Innovation, in the European Commission will provide a few closing words. So over now to the speed dating sessions. What do you see? A little spark, slowly growing bigger, lighting up the dark. Imagine what it could be. What do you see? A robot that feels sustainable fiber or software that captures the world in 3D. Wood and wind turbines, transparent solar panels, reinventing the way we use our energy. A tiny idea, so crazy it's hard to believe. An invention with the intention to change the world drastically. It's something we would love to see. So tell us what you need to reimagine, to reinvent the world. We can give you a place where unicorns are born. You can chase your dreams, helping hands, machinery, bigger plans, or just a chance to show the world something they haven't seen. So, what do you see?
Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's great to be here today discussing how to build businesses from breakthrough science. Um, as we all know, many, if not most, of the discoveries that lay the foundations for future innovations are developed within the academic community. So it is therefore very important that research matures to the point where it can deliver a benefit to society, both in terms of technological development and economic growth. The launch of the new European Innovation Council, EIC, with a budget of 10 billion euros for the period of 2021 to 2027, aims to nurture promising ideas and technology from discovery to invention to innovation. So-called spin-outs, the creation of businesses that are born out of academic research, will be supported by a number of different EIC programs. The Pathfinder program will support high-risk projects with a low technology readiness level, where emerging technologies meet groundbreaking science, otherwise known as deep tech. This is where futuristic ideas with real potential are created, many of which will begin their journey towards market impact through the EIC transition program and activities. The EIC accelerator supports startups and companies bringing deep tech innovations to market. And a major part of this is the EIC fund, which will make direct equity investments in EIC supported companies. Today, we've gathered an impressive set of panelists who all have experienced this journey firsthand from uh, creating fundamental scientific discoveries to innovations and commercializations firsthand. First of all, we have the pleasure of Dr. Ingmar Herr, whose PhD thesis in 2000 led to the discovery of RNA vaccines and the founding of the company CureVac, whose anti-COVID-19 vaccine could be available later this year, most likely around May. Ingmar is a member of the EIC Pilot Advisory Board and has helped design the EIC programs that are launching today. Ingmar, nice to have you. Um, when and how did you realize that you wanted to spin out of academia and build a business out of your scientific discoveries? That's a very good question. It's 20 years back. So we write the year 2000. And well, I was thrilled by my PhD work uh, where I spotted that RNA can be a new kind of drug. Um, and I saw a revolution in drug development already when I did this experiments. And First of all, I, I didn't want to found a company. I wanted to uh, go to pharma industry, have a pharma job like everybody in my lab. So I was forced to found because nobody was taking over my idea. So then I had to do it by myself. So I had to switch my whole things. And uh, there was a really good um, support from uh, the state of Baden-Württemberg um, where we get a fund uh, half position as we had already the PhD work and uh, we could use this half position to found our company. So we had a two years fund and these two years they were very, this was very important for us because we had to gather all the results and we had really to try to get VCs on board and these kind of things. And it was a kind of test run, whether we are able to, fall, um, to, to, to succeed here, um, which was good. So we could use the same laboratories we are used to at the university rooms, we were able to create our own business there. This was very helpful to us. Interesting. Thanks. And what were the key obstacles and incentives you found along that journey? And are these EIC programs addressing those? I think it's very important to create a network from the very beginning. Um, to have experts who can guide you in lots of questions. You have so many questions, not only on a technical basis, also how to gather money, how to get enough money how to intensivize people, how to fascinate people to follow you, and what are the right people for your team, because it's team building. It's all about a team. It's nothing about the founder itself. He has to found the right team um, because the founder can't do anything. And, and this is very important. Uh, so the network is the most important thing at the beginning. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, we're also joined by Silvia Scaglioni, who's the Chief Research Officer and President of company React for Life, which produces bioreactors for regenerative medicine and cancer research. She's also coordinating the FET Open Project B2B, which is a predecessor of the EIC Pathfinder program. Silvia, I'd like to get your perspective, uh, since you're another example of an academic researcher who's become an entrepreneur. What motivated you to take that journey? Yes, uh, as a biomedical engineer, my passion has always been to do something uh, that could generate a benefit for citizens and for the society. And therefore, my, my wish is to translate the basic research in, in a product that could be uh, reliable, first of all, but also usable and accessible by anyone. 
And for this reason, four years ago, I funded the Riyadh for Life, which is an innovative company that has the aim to provide technological solutions like uh, microphysiological systems uh, resembling in vitro the human body to uh, accelerate the disease knowledge and boost the personalized medicine. In, uh, in this company, we have already concluded the interesting uh, validations uh, such as uh, in, in the field of uh, cancer disease uh, that may accelerate the personalized medicine. And uh, different pharma are already some uh, of our customers. And the SME phase one instrument that we have won uh, during the EIC pilot uh, allowed it to better define our business model and the market positioning. Also thanks to the tailored custom made coaching that the EU provided to us. Great, thanks Silvia. And, and since you also coordinate the FET Open project, let me ask you how Horizon 2020 funding has enabled you to bring technology a step closer to commercialization. Yes, the FAT project that I'm coordinating, it's really an amazing high risk collaborative disruptive research. It lasts four years and it has received about 4 million of funding. The FAT project allows to advance in the integration of different uh, uh, disruptive technologies like uh, organoids, uh, bioprinting, uh, microphysiological systems, finally generating a prototype that we have the option to validate as a proof of concept within the FAT project. But these disruptive innovations uh, need funding and time to um, generate and progress uh, towards the market. And uh, due to their uh, intrinsic uh, riskness, uh, it's really difficult to receive funds. Uh, and this is the reason of why the EIC Pathfinder allowed to us uh, to, um, to go ahead towards the market. And I believe that the outcome of the FED project uh, uh, will become uh, the product uh, uh, the prototype at the end of the project, uh, more attractive uh, also for the VC funding uh, with the final aim to reach the market. Thank you. You mentioned the amount of time taken to reach the market. So that's probably a good time to bring in our final panelist, Louis de Lillère, who's the CEO of CoreWave, a French company producing blood pumps based on a nature mimicking wave membrane technology. CoreWave was one of the first companies to receive investment from the EIC fund of 15 million euros as part of a 35 million funding round. Louis, as Sylvia just mentioned, it can take a really long time for deep tech startups to bring their innovations to market, particularly in the medical technology field, which is complicated by things like regulation and approval processes, which vary from state to state. Uh, what do these new UIC programs mean for a company like CoreWave in terms of raising investment? And how do you think that the Accelerator program can help European companies like yours? So CoreWave is a medical device company involved in the fight against heart failure. Every year, millions of heart failure patients either die or survive in trouble condition. And our mission at CoreWave is to save heart failure patients and offer them an active life. Our work is based on the invention of a French engineer who came up with a disruptive pumping technology, a technology that can change the, the, the face of cardiac assist, the type of technology that can give birth to a, a global leader. But as an entrepreneur, uh, I mean, there's a legitimate question is, uh, is Europe the right place to, to build such a company? Indeed, in 2020, uh, if you look at uh, investment in medical device, it, in Europe, we had like, three times lower investment than, than in three, three times lower investment than in, in China and eight times lo lower investment than, than in the US. And with EIC fund, the European Commission is telling entrepreneurs, yes, Europe is the right place to, to, uh, to, to, to build these companies. And in particular for CoWave, EIC gives us the, mean to, the means to achieve our ambition, to realize our full potential here in Europe, to attract top talents from all continents, to uh, transform our uh, prototypes into an implantable product and, and ultimately to bring that product to patients. Thank you. Um, and since you've actually received a, a direct fund from funding from the EIC, 
Let me ask you, particularly for a deep tech company like CoreWave, what's the difference between taking on EIC funding versus other private investors such as venture capital or, or perhaps national funding programs? So first of all, I like to say that they're complementary. In the case of the C round of CoWave, they co-invested. So uh, about half of the funding is coming from private investors, and, and actually part of them is is a private investor and the uh, the French sovereign bank. So they they actually invest together. Um, and the uh, this you know existing investor from CoWave are bringing their track record of building su successful uh, products in the field, successful companies in the field. So that's uh, very helpful. Then, for sure, there is a, a difference, and in particular, there is a different a difference of, of scale. Um, the IC fund is way larger than any uh, VC fund in, in Europe, and 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 therefore they they you know they they really have yeah uh, different means. And uh, at this point, I don't believe that there is any uh, investor in Europe, VC investor, that would have the leeway to invest 15 million euro in a preclinical company uh, as CoWave. So that is really. Um, you know, not for in their fitting in their investment strategy uh, that they, they, they keep their larger tickets for for uh, later stage clinical phase or um, or revenue phase. So it's it's really the, I mean the EIC fund is really filling a gap here, and it's it's fantastic to to have them on board. Wonderful, thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone for for joining today. We're now going to move on to the next session, which is specifically about the EIC investing in deep tech. Thank you. Hello, and uh, a warm welcome to the launch event of the European Innovation Council. My name is Robin Walters. I'm the founding editor of Tech.eu. Uh, we're a leading news and market intelligence company uh, focused on the European innovation industry. Today, I am very pleased to be joined by a number of esteemed entrepreneurs and investors to talk about the challenges and opportunities of the deep tech field in Europe. Uh, deep tech is one of those terms that means different things to different people, but in general, the consensus is that it concerns technologies such as artificial intelligence, semiconductors, robotics, self-driving cars, blockchain, quantum computing, etc. Uh, they basically have very deep roots in science and advanced engineering. Uh, in general, deep tech takes a relatively long time to develop and find good product market fit. Uh, it's usually more capital intensive than other types of uh, digital products. Uh, and it also has a high risk of never making it to market or finding sufficient commercial traction. Uh, when deep tech overcomes those hurdles, however, it tends to generate great rewards, uh, breakthrough advancements in technology and science uh, that can often have an outsized positive impact on the economy, society and humanity as a whole. Uh, Europe, of course, has strong roots in science and engineering, our academia world class, and there are reports that suggest that European deep tech companies are worth a combined 700 billion euros today and counting. Still, there is a lot more that can be done to unlock the value that Europe's deep talent pool has to offer and to make sure that the right technologies are funded by the right investors to bring them to market on an international scale. I'm delighted to have a conversation about this topic uh, with Herman Hauser of Amadeus Capital and of course well known for his pivotal role at companies like Acorn Computers and ARM. Uh, we have Irina Haivas, she's a partner at leading investment firm Atomico and last but not least Veronica Udova, uh, she's the co-founder and CEO of life science company S Biomedic. Welcome to our panel everyone and please uh, share with us your insights on how Europe can play a role in the global deep tech race in the years to come. Mr. Hauser, maybe let's start with you. Are you optimistic about Europe's future in deep tech? And if so, why? Absolutely. But we also have to acknowledge our place in the world, which is behind America and increasingly behind uh, China. So we really have to, uh, uh, have to up our game. And one of the reasons why we are so excited about the European Innovation Council is that we do have 10 billion to make a difference uh, to the investment environment uh, for, for deep tech in Europe, because uh, uh, Europe still only has one fifth of the venture capital uh, of America. So we need to increase the amount of money that goes into deep tech. And of course, the uh, EIC fund is trying to do exactly that. Mr. Dova, you were the recipient of an EIC grant, I believe, uh, last year. Uh, maybe share us a little bit more about uh, your journey and your views on uh, the deep tech space in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for us, actually, uh, we have made quite interesting experience because with as biomedic, we went a little bit around the world. Uh, we actually originate from Europe. So I'm from the Czech Republic. My other co-founder is German and my third co-founder is Spanish. 
but we actually found our first funding in Chile. So we moved the whole project initially to uh, Santiago de Chile for seven months. And then from there, we were considering if we should uh, continue uh, down there in Latin America or go to, um, to um, the States where one of my co-founders was doing his postdoc at that time in Harvard, or if we should, should go back to Europe. Um, eventually we have decided to go back to Europe where we, where we have a little bit of more network, but uh, funnily enough, also uh, the regulatory uh, space was more beneficial for us to, to establish ourselves in Europe. And um, yeah, despite the fact that the initial funding is quite difficult to get, uh, we were able then to leverage the first European grants, which actually got us over the first first hurdle. And then um, right now, for us, um, the location here is is really given the regulatory landscape and and the options and the network and the knowledge that we have also within Belgium. It's um, I feel we are really really well positioned here. Great. Well, welcome to Europe or welcome back to Europe then. Um, Ms. Haivas, uh, you work for a company that is very active in investing in deep tech uh, in Europe and beyond. Uh, maybe share with us your views on, 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 on the future of deep tech in Europe. Um, I think we're, I mean, it's, interest, it's an interesting debate. What is deep tech? Because the, techno, the deep tech of today becomes the mainstream of, of tomorrow, right? At some point, cloud was considered deep tech to some extent. So I don't think this time is different. Um, and the, essentially the technologies that are being built and defined as deep tech it, everywhere in the world uh, will become mainstream, uh, mainstream technologies of tomorrow. I think Europe has a few interesting advantages in deep tech um, that may have not necessarily been there in kind of like the internet era, for instance. Um, one is the fact that Deep tech, deep tech companies tend to be global from day one. So they serve a global market often, um, which for instance, if you think about some of the kind of, you know, early internet consumer plays, one of the, the challenges in Europe has always been to kind of grow beyond your local market. And that is not there with deep tech. Um, the other, the other um, strong point of Europe is that we obviously have a lot of strong universities and, and leading universities and therefore IP coming out of those. Um, and that's again, an, an opportunity to, to, to play. Um, and then the third one I would say is this mindset shift from academia to entrepreneurship that you see. So it used to be that, you know, if you were very good ac academically at your PhD, you wanted to stay in, in, ac in an academic career path. Now increasingly more people that finish a PhD, um, see entrepreneurship as a real career option. And part of it is driven by the fact that some of the costs have gone down. Like for instance, in, in genetics, you can buy a sequencer now for, you can afford to buy a sequencer while before it used to be accessible only in kind of big academic labs or big, big corporate labs. So you had to stay in one of these big institutions to work on that particular field. So there's a few tailwinds that come from, you know, um, cost and, and uh, access as well. And overall, you know, I think Europe has an interesting opportunity in deep tech. I think the challenge is more around um, driving those commercial successes through investment. There is still, there are still way less investors in Europe um, than in the US, especially when it comes to funding later stage, so we come in often at series A, B, but when you think about the later rounds where these companies need a couple of hundred million once they break through, those are still scarce um, in Europe. And then the appetite for taking that sort of risk on average is, is still a little bit lower, I would say. Yeah, and we'll address that funding up in, uh, in a bit more detail uh, later on as well. Uh, but you've brought me perfectly to my next question, which is that all of this deep talent that we have within academia, in science, um, how can we effectively ensure that that talent doesn't go lost, that we can find uh, commercialization for the IP uh, that is being generated in those academia? And, and also maybe as a follow-up question, how can private investors work together with the European Commission and, and the EIC for that matter, uh, to really unlock the value there. Uh, maybe Mr. Hauser has some ideas on that? Oh, sure. Well, that's exactly uh, the reason why the EIC was set up and why we made the rules of the EIC to uh, make sure that the EIC is a catalyst to crowd in 
uh, the, uh, the market to crowd in uh, the main VCs in Europe, um, uh, including, of course, Atomico that has been already uh, very supportive of a number of uh, EIC uh, uh, startups uh, in the past. So uh, uh, the way this works is really uh, as everywhere else in the world through an ecosystem uh, that consists of the VC, uh, the governments, uh, the universities. It is just that uh, the, the clusters, the, the university clusters, the deep tech clusters that exist in the US and uh, now also in China uh, are still uh, only incipient in Europe. Uh, th there are quite a few, but they need to be uh, supported with a lot more money uh, than we've had in the past. And Irina already, already made uh, the very good point that we actually don't have a startup problem in Europe. Uh, we produce more startups uh, in Europe than the United States. Few people know this. We have a scale-up problem. Uh, so the problem is that once uh, these startups make it to uh, tens of millions, is how can we make sure that they go then into hundreds of millions and, and billions uh, of revenue? That's our big problem. And that's uh, where the EIC with uh, 15 million uh, euros into a single company uh, may be leveraged by a factor of two or three uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the market, with, with uh, VCs who put up another uh, 30 or 50 million, we get to the 50 to 100 million uh, rounds that are still so rare in Europe. Well, we have one of the startups uh, that you're uh, talking about on the panel. So, Mr. Dova, maybe you can uh, compliment. Uh, have you had any conversation with private investors as you were developing as well Biomatic, which is, of course, heavily rooted in science? Uh, and how have those conversations been different from, uh, from the EIC, for example? Yeah, yeah. So we, we have indeed, we have an investor experience. For us, uh, though, it was quite important that uh, we try to stay quite lean in, in the beginning. So we try to actually not, not go for, uh, for big investments uh, early on. And I think that was also something that Irina mentioned that uh, in Europe, we have quite good access already to good technologies, to, to relatively uh, to a lot of good uh, people, uh, highly educated people, which are compared, for example, to US, uh, much more affordable um, in terms of salaries and so on. We also heavily took advantage of, of um, incubators. So basically we are part of the Johnson & Johnson JLabs incubator, which makes it initially much, much easier to kind of go over the initial phase. Um, so we, we try to kind of, uh, yeah, stay um, as lean as possible with the, with the investor investments or with the, with the private funding, private money. Um, but I think, yeah, we are, we're still relatively early. So um, I think we will still come across what, what Herman and Irina mentioned um, that, yeah, the bigger, bigger amounts, um, how easy or how difficult is it to, to then access? We still, we still have to make that experience. My, the, only, the only thing maybe to mention uh, what I see when, for example, being exposed towards uh, American startups is that uh, they are quite often, despite the fact they don't have so much data, they don't have so many results, they do not have so much uh, technology background, they are much bolder and much more confident to, to go for uh, bigger rounds, going, um, yeah, bigger going, uh, showing the success they, they have. And I think that's something we still have to learn as, as European startups to be a bit more confident, be bolder and uh, yeah, think think a little bit bigger. Yeah, and evidently if you think bigger, you need um, bigger, uh, deeper pockets uh, as well. Uh, Rina's already addressed this, uh, this funding gap, so I'm gonna come back to you. Uh, how can we fix that? Can we really um, do something about that in Europe to address that, that scale up funding gap? Um, I mean, I think there's there's a natural evolution of the ecosystem that will happen um, and we need a few successes for people to start actually paying attention. Um, so that's not something we can do, but that's just kind of a, a, um, a journey we have to take. But um, there are, of course, um, in, you know, initiatives like like state driven initiatives to back deep tech company scale ups or European wide initiatives are, are a good alternative. Um, the other, um, you know, the other option is for European investors to try and tap earlier into the pockets of like global investors and just think globally from, from day one, sorry, not European investors, European entrepreneurs to think globally from, from day one, because I do think it's, 
it's a matter of like showing those successes and then people will follow and scale up investors will follow. I think we're already seeing more, a bit more of, the, of that, but I've, it's not easy to accelerate because it's not easy to kind of like all of a sudden start, you know, five funds that are all focused on deep tech scale ups that that doesn't happen overnight and that doesn't happen without precedence. So it has to be a combination of non, you know, non-private funds. I think the other interesting um, thing that's happening in Europe is that some of the successful entrepreneurs in tech, so not in not in deep tech, uh, that are now, um, you know, IPOing or or essentially have generated enough wealth and are thinking about what are they going to do next, are building these sort of are are interested in in deep tech um and part of it is for impact for climate for a variety of of topics and i think one example is uh daniel from spotify who's essentially you know putting one billion of his own um like net worth into actually building deep tech companies in europe it is not scale up it's it's company building but it does signal an interest in in the space and an acknowledgement of the importance of backing some of this innovation. Yeah, I fully agree. There's definitely a shift of that kind happening uh, underway in Europe right now. Um, Mr. Hauser, you already mentioned this uh, in the beginning, but the EIC is basically coming out of the pilot phase with about 10 billion euros in funding. Is that enough though? Uh, no, it, it is not. And that's uh, why it's so important that the 10 billion uh, euros is used to crowd in the market. So, so far, we've actually been doing uh, very well uh, in that for every one euro that we put into a company, on average, three to five euros come from the market. So this is actually not a 10 billion a euro, but more like a 30 to 50 billion uh, euro initiative, uh, which uh, which will make a difference. Uh, I mean, it is over a seven year period, of course, which is the period of uh, uh, Horizon Europe. But it does, uh, of course, make the EIC by far the largest uh, deep tech fund. And that's another reason why we insisted that uh, more than half of the equity money has to come from, from the market so that it, the EIC money acts as a catalyst to crowd in the market uh, rather than the market having to be worried that the uh, EIC becomes a dominant player and crowds them out. So that's why we have the rule that more than 50% of the money has to come from the market. Uh, the EIC has also started a very interesting instrument, in my view at least, uh, is the EIC fund, uh, where they'll be investing directly into startups. Uh, Irina, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about you know this this dynamic between private investors and, and government funding. Um, what's your view on this? Do you think they can then happily coexist or not? In terms of whether investors would come uh, and join a, a, a syndicate with government funding or come after government funding, what in yes. what specific? Yes, correct. Do you think that's a good evolution or or a bad one for the entrepreneurs actually? I mean, I think like uh, it's not it's not new that some of our comp- some of our companies in deep tech do get grant funding today, whether it's from Horizon 2020 or from other sources. It doesn't necessarily happen always in the same round syndicates. So generally, the round we would be involved in tends to be a private round. I haven't yet seen a lot of models where in the same round you would have a syndicate between. Um, a private and a public investor, uh, by public meaning a, a government body or a, something like EIC, and I cannot answer that therefore, right? Because I don't know how what would be the friction and what would be the 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 admin require. I think the only kind of question I would have is: Can these organizations that are non-private, non-funds, move fast enough to? to kind of match the realities of how quickly funding rounds happen, because often those happen in a couple of weeks and we have to make decisions very quickly. And therefore the the barrier is if if you do take much longer than that to make a decision, then you're just not going to make the investment. But whether they can coexist on a cap table, um, you know, of, in, in principle, it should be possible, but the devil's in the detail, like what are the requirements? What are the 
rights in the next round, what is the governance that comes with that funding and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of models that you can uh, deploy there. Yeah, so the, so the EIC, of course, has, has gone out of their way to, to be VC friendly, to be able to make these decisions fast and also act in exactly the same way as uh, any other VC investment with the same rights and the same obligations and no special deals in terms of uh, uh, a, a, a government um, uh, initiative. So, so this was one of the starting points, of course, of the EIC yeah. to make sure that uh, it does fit uh, easily into the existing cap tables of, uh, of the VC world. Great. Well, deep tech in Europe, um, definitely a topic that I could go on about for, for many hours. Uh, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, Veronica, I'm going to actually give you uh, the virtual floor uh, just to give some, some closing thoughts as well, and then uh, we can wrap it up. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I just want to quickly follow up on what also Irina said because I have to admit that uh, first, uh, when we when we uh, got an investment from EIC in terms of equity investment, it made us quite nervous exactly for the reasons: how long is it going to take? Uh, is it there going to be a fit and so on? I have to say that so far uh, we're making quite a good experience. So we're going for a first half in a convertible loan, second half as a part of an equity round. And basically through that, we, we going through the, through the um, due diligence a bit earlier with the EIC, which then and I, I hope will enable us later when we when we closing the round later this year, that we might be then able to, to, to decide fast and, and be faster where the EIC then, um, as, as I understand, will follow basically the, the lead investor. So uh, we will be making this experience this year, but I have to say so far, so far um, looks good and and uh, looks um, as a as an important validation for for our project as well. So so far very happy. Great. Well, happiness is very important, and we'll be very we'll be watching very closely, of course, uh, what happens next for your company as well. Um, to everyone, thank you so much for your time. We have to wrap up, but that was a very insightful discussion, uh, and I think we can be bullish about the future of deep tech in Europe, and hopefully, you can all play an active role in in developing that future. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, best of luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted uh, to welcome you in this third uh, speed dating exchange um, uh, with uh, two great guests, uh, Jim uh, Snaver, who is uh, chair of Siemens, uh, also works um, with Möller -Mer Merckx, and has been uh, a key player in the EIC um, advisory uh, board, um, uh, leading us to creating the EIC, and uh, Stavriana Kofteros, uh, who is the vice chair of the uh, Cyprus uh, Innovation Authority, and in this uh, function also an angel investor and part of the EIC Investment Committee, so very much part of making the fund today a success. So welcome to both of you. Uh, I'm really delighted to have uh, the opportunity to, to be part of this conversation. As Director General for Research and Innovation, um, I, I was um, involved in uh, in creating the European Innovation Council, which holds great promises, but also very concrete results already after one year and a half of, uh, of a very large scale uh, pilot. So all these um, we will share with you uh, also in this um, short speed dating exchange. What we will try to explore briefly is how um, the EIC can help um, innovation ecosystems to be part and uh, possibly in our expectation impactful in Europe's uh, green and uh, digital transformation, particularly in the green transformation as this is about sustainability. Big corporates, public funders are of course uh, very much strategically investing uh, in these uh, green transformations. Uh, but it is, um, I think, very clear that all technological solutions, but also uh, societal uh, developments are not yet all available to bring um, Europe to a carbon neutral continent. And even the 55% reduction by 2030 are a deep challenge. Well, the EIC is about deep tech innovation and deep tech certainly is also highly, highly relevant uh, for uh, these uh, transformations. So that's what we, we will now briefly um, uh, explore with uh, starting, uh, Jim, uh, with you, if, if I can. 
so how, how do you see um, uh, the contribution of innovation ecosystems for a very large European company like Siemens? How do you see that? Well, thank you very much and good morning. It's um, an honor for me to be part of today's uh, event, but also the group that has been working hard for a couple of years now, it's been uh, truly um, inspiring. Um, see, I'm convinced that this uh, next phase of digitization and, and disruption will really focus around industrial value chains, not so much the consumer toys, if I may, uh, anymore. And I also believe that we're moving from what I call ego uh, systems, focusing on capturing value, to ecosystems focusing on impact. Impact in particular, as you said, on the green agenda, but also around what I call responsible digitization. And that is where Siemens plays today. So our interest is genuine. We are in industry value chains and we have impact in mind. So which are these ecosystems? Well, healthcare, for instance, moving towards more individualized therapy and prevention, manufacturing, smart cities, mobility, and even energy. These are fundamental infrastructures and industrial value chains that we need to dramatically improve. And now, and now we can. So what are we looking for? at Siemens, we're looking for innovative companies that can help accelerate a future which is more sustainable. And, and what can we provide? I think we provide you know, platforms, we provide also global reach. And, and one good example, uh, you know, we launched an ecosystem around additive manufacturing, where we deliver a platform and, and global reach for startups to really have more scale in the partnership with Siemens. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, so indeed, uh, big corporates can help uh, startups um, and startups can then also help big corporates uh, uh, get to uh, breakthrough ideas and possibly then also team up. This is also very much as Jim, I think you know, what uh, the European Innovation Council is already uh, piloting in corporate days where we, we, we connect with these um, big European corporates and, and try to to do some matchmaking with um, uh, the very large uh, number of uh, deep tech innovators which are connected to us. If I move to you, uh, uh, Stavriana, as, as vice chair of the Cyprus uh, Research and Innovation Foundation, um, you look at it as an angel investor. What are your expectations uh, of the EIC uh, for Cyprus's innovation uh, uh, capacities and impact? It's a pleasure to be here and an honor, obviously, and it's been a pleasure and an honor to be involved in the EIC ever since the very, very early on pilots and amazing to see how it's uh, transforming and taking official shape to truly change uh, Europe, because that's the expectations. And by doing that, because everything is about synergy, much like our panel today, we have Zimmons, a, a big corporate with a uh, uh, myself from a little country like Cyprus, from a small ecosystem, Europe is so diverse in sizes and in, in, in everything. And that's what exactly what we need is all the actors. It's the sum of the parts so that we all play together in order to scale up Europe. Practically speaking, when, when I look at the robust innovation ecosystem for the future of Europe, 99% of that applies for Cyprus as well. Everything that was identified for across the ecosystems, it applies to Cyprus with minimum changes. And I'm sure it applies to other countries in that magnitude as well. We need linkages, much like we're here, linkages of a small ecosystem to a larger ecosystem, linkages of startups and innovative companies to corporates, access to funding in a way so that we can create pipeline for, for the EIC and for Europe in order to scale, because we, we need the numbers. It is also a statistics game. And, and indeed, I agree with what Jim said. It's about not just the, the ego and ecosystem, totally agree with you. It's time to make an impact and scale Europe. And to do that, we need to scale all the ecosystems and, and create that uh, value and impact locally and European-wise. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I really liked uh, this uh, notion of, of indeed connecting uh, uh, across uh, national research and innovation systems and ecosystems, and then also uh, uh, across the value chains. And I mean, if I move to you, Jim, again, uh, the, can, can the EIC, I mean, Siemens is, is very much a, a large company investing itself and, and on the path 
uh, on of, of its green and digital transformation. But um, uh, from that example and maybe others which which you, which you know, how can can I see um, programs help these bigger corporates accelerate their transformation? How do you see that? Well, I think that's a, a key uh, decisive question, of course. And uh, I always argued that that you know innovation for impact is the combination of uh, big ideas, so big new ideas multiplied by the scale. So if you have a great idea and you don't bring it to market, then you don't have impact. You just have a great idea. And, and I think, you know, of course, Siemens, you know, with more than 300,000 employees, we, we have kind of both. But even as a large organization with lots of funding, we can see that some of the big ideas we simply cannot generate internally. And, and we're humble enough to realize that this is the case. And that actually means that we are looking for, you know, creative ideas, new ideas, breakthroughs, where we, instead of, you know, assuming we can do it inside, we work with other companies outside and create ecosystems where we can add the scalability to those great ideas. We've created an organization called Next 47, which really participates in, in disruption through supporting some of these startups. And for me, the accelerator is a perfect instrument in the EIC to identify such ideas and scale them faster and bringing in large organizations to help scale that. And now, you know, with, with those uh, programs, it's become much easier and much faster. But we also need breakthrough innovations in Europe. Um, quantum computing, for instance, will be a huge breakthrough. And again, they have, you know, the Pathfinder for me is the perfect example of an instrument that addresses exactly that. How do we identify breakthroughs and make sure that they actually get the best possible chances of becoming something meaningful? Last week, um, the European Commission launched the um, Digital Compass for Europe. And so now is the right moment to combine that compass, which is really about, let's say, scalable but responsible digitization and you bring that together with these instruments of the EIC, I think we have a huge opportunity to show the rest of the world how we can use technology to make a better future for all, which I think where Europe has a unique cultural heritage. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I, I, I would very much um, uh, concur, concur with you on that. I think on science and engineering, uh, Europe is a powerhouse. And indeed, the challenge is to bring these, this disruptive science into uh, concrete ideas and then indeed scaling scale them up uh, bring them to the market to to make a difference the ic had uh, in this pilot phase 14000 uh, one four 14000 um, applications of course not all of them were uh, excellent but very many of them were many are not uh, funded immediately and i think there is here really uh, a wealth of of great ideas which i hope uh, can be then picked up uh, by 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 big great companies in Europe, um, uh, and, and then really bringing that together. I mean, one challenge, uh, Estoriana, which, which we also have, and where possibly the IC, I think, can have an impact, is on the risk aversion of, um, of uh, private investors. I mean, my, my brief tells me I should say European private investors, but I would say private investors more generally uh, with um, uh, technological startups, deep tech ones particularly. Uh, do you think the IC will make a difference? Do you see it already? Absolutely, yes. It, uh, and, and that's the big hope, not just, you know, to, to be romantic about it, but it, it, it is de-risking uh, earlier on deep tech innovation in a way that it makes it attractive. The news about the EIC fund are literally music to the ear of the, of the innovation ecosystem across Europe, because that would truly be a catalyst uh, for de-risking and kind of uh, helping with the risk aversion of European investors. When you have an institutional investor like the EIC going in earlier on, it is, as a fact, de-risking the, the situation. And with the support that these companies receive through the EIC accelerator and the services, it, it creates an environment that's supporting and more fertile for them to succeed. At the same time, it will also, I expect it will also make a positive impact where it comes to, shall we say, catalyzing M&A activity. So uh, big corporates like Siemens, for example, can get in early on and acquire the innovation and the team, which is an exit strategy for, for startups. It exists in other ecosystems internationally, and we, we need to get in that game as well because we are very unique 
in Europe, very you know, engineer oriented. We have amazing technology, amazing science, and we need that to come into the market and provide value to the European citizens by products, by the taxes that the companies are going to pay because everything fits in. And I think that the EIC is definitely going to, well, not fingers crossed because it has shown <laughs> the path it's walking and it's, it's a good one that we will be able to realize that and, and really scale and have an impact. Great, Tariana, thank you very much. Uh, Jim as well, thanks a lot for, uh, for this uh, exchange, uh, which um, I mean, really, I hope gives you a sense of uh, what uh, the European Innovation Council uh, will be uh, doing uh, with, with all of you, which is uh, connecting, uh, connecting science uh, and innovation, connecting uh, this European effort with very many national um, instruments and research and innovation systems, and then indeed allowing uh, impact to be achieved uh, uh, with scaling up, we hope uh, fast um, and in Europe, uh, of course, scaling up also by uh, teaming up um, uh, across Europe with uh, our large uh, uh, engineering and technology uh, companies, these corporates, which I have no doubt will play a major role in, in allowing mm -hmm. these very, very many innovators in Europe uh, to, to come to, to the market and make uh, their innovations um, impactful. So this is um, the perspective. Uh, the European Innovation Council is now launched at scale. Uh, benefiting from a year and a half of this very large pilot, uh, but maybe as important as a pilot, benefiting from um, the advice of, um, of great innovators um, like you, Jim, uh, great innovators in, and investors like you, Stavriana. And I think this is also one of these, the hallmarks of the European Innovation Council, benefiting uh, from the wealth of um, experience uh, and uh, disruptive ideas um, across Europe, and you're very kind to make it available to this um, European effort on innovation, impact innovations, as um, our friends in the US would call it. So thank you very much uh, to both of you. And I think with that, uh, we conclude um, this um, uh, exchange. The European Innovation Council has been a great ambition for the Commission uh, over the last two uh, commissions. And I'm really very delighted to have been able to, to help Maria Gabriel uh, and President von der Leyen now really kick off uh, the European Innovation Council. So we heard the President, we heard also Commissioner uh, Maria Gabriel. Uh, I was also very pleased to see that we had uh, the European Parliament um, with Christian Ela and also the Portuguese Council Presidency with Minister Manuel Eitor. This really, I hope, gave you a, a sense that uh, Europeans are uh, very ambitious on um, disruptive innovation. Uh, they have set the bar, I think, really high for the European Innovation Council, not just uh, to spur innovation and scaling up, but do it with uh, great impact. We have in Europe um, uh, been traditionally very ambitious on science and research. And 10 years ago, we established the European Research Council, which I sometimes call uh, Europe's Nobel Prize factory. And we are now equally um, ambitious for innovation uh, with the European Innovation Council, which I personally have little doubt, if I look at the pilot phase, that it will very soon turn into um, Europe's uh, unicorn factory. But as you could see from the exchanges um, in, uh, in this uh, short uh, launch event, um, this is about indeed scaling up, uh, but scaling up also to make um, a difference. And I think if you look at what corporates are, are seeing, if you look at what investors are expecting, obviously when you look at what uh, uh, policymakers um, uh, are asking the IC to do. I have little doubt that the European Innovation Council will help great ideas to emerge, scale up into the market, but that these ideas will also allow uh, Europe and possibly beyond to, to transform um, into green societies and green uh, economies and also in a sustainable uh, digitalization. So that's what we hope uh, for the European Innovation Council, as you can see, the bar is very high. So 
I would like to finish by wishing all the best uh, to um, the teams um, around the EIC, of course, the advisory committee uh, for taking so much of their time to, to help it succeed. And now also the teams in the um, European Innovation Council in the executive agency, which will support the European Innovation Council uh, and its management um, uh, with uh, Jean-David Malo uh, leading that effort to all of you uh, many thanks for the pilot phase and all the very best for making this yet another major European success. We will be there with you. Thanks to all of you for your interest and come to the European Innovation Council. We are there to help. Thank you very much.